There we go. Perfect. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered why. All good. How's your day going? Not too bad. How about yours? You know what? It's pretty good. It's um, it's been a good week so far. Surprisingly, despite everything that's so up and down nowadays. <laughs> so you're based out of Calgary. I am. What about yourself okay. for now? Where yeah. are you? Indianapolis, Indiana. So, yeah, we'll buy one, get one free action. So. Yeah, exactly. I'm is sure... there any other places that have um, a great speedway or a racetrack? Or is there a reason why you went to Indianapolis specifically? There's no real reason. Um, it, it, well, I shouldn't say no real reason. Um, I guess the long story short of it, um, per capita, there's more race car drivers that live here than pretty well anywhere else in the world. So ah. it was just we race here quite a bit. Um, like in my formula car career before sports cars, I had raced here two times a year, almost every year for like the last six years. So it's a city I knew I had friends here. It's small. I I'm not a big, you know, Calgary is about as big of a city as I would ever want to live in. Indy's kind of like, it's a sister city to Calgary in a lot of ways, okay. you know um, it's yeah. They have their, their one NFL team and they have an NBA team, but it's just, the feel, the people, it's kind of Midwesty, which is a good lot vibes. like Canada. Oh, really good vibes. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Could we see yourself moving there one day permanently? I kind of consider myself moved here permanently, to be really? honest. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, racing in Canada, you can only race for six no. months out of the year, and there's not really a professional tour in Canada. No. <laughs> so <laughs> That's your zone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I, – I really – if you go to the right parts of the U.S., it's awesome. You wouldn't even really, you know, the people are super friendly here. Oh, that's awesome. Congrats, by the way. Thank you. So exciting. So, no. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was kind of COVID-driven, uh, but it ended up, yeah. It was a move that needed to be. I've been debating this for the last, like, four years. Like, when was I going to pack my bags and truly go? Do you miss home? Yeah. I mean, you miss your family for sure, but, um, it's just nice to be one thing that's been a huge benefit this year is on the back to back weeks, actually having a home. Yeah. So when you say, do I miss home every season prior to this, I haven't had a home either. Cause you're just living on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. So at least this year it's like, perfect. I've got a place to cook food, wash clothes, yeah. it's clean. I can sleep. I know where my house is. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's but, awesome. For the listeners, Parker, how did you get started in this? Coming from Alberta is huge to see this happen. I mean, you're one of the top drivers in Canada. Yeah, it's uh, so. I mean, it all starts with my dad, which yeah. was he raced everything but four wheels is kind of the joke. Um, so he raced dirt bikes, he raced Grand Prix bikes, then he got into racing boats. Um, so growing up ages one to five, I watched him race jet boats um, in Alberta. So there's very popular rivers in Alberta and Alberta is kind of a hot spot for, for jet boating, which a lot of people don't know. Um, so watching him race, I just wanted to go fast. And the first Avenue for that was dirt bikes. Um, we bought a dirt bike when I was five years old, a little Yamaha PW 50. And immediately my mom pretty well put the brakes on that and said, we're going to sell the bike. You're not becoming a dirt bike racer. That's too dangerous. So then, uh, I had to wait till I was eight to get a go-kart at the Calgary Kart Race Club. And that's where I got my start. And the rest is history. I mean, I literally, I, my dad tells the story best. I drove a cart my first day and I got out of the cart and said, that is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't care what anything else is. And at the time I was playing hockey and doing a bunch of other stuff. And immediately I didn't drop hockey right off the bat because it was still a good winter sport. And obviously karting and hockey aren't really competing for time, but um, it, that changed my life and being as stubborn as I am, I have kept through to racing for, uh, <laughs> from eight to 23. So my gosh. And has it been the goal to be in NASCAR or Indy 500 or formula one? What is the goal here? Um, well, I mean, the story always goes, and I think just about anybody, um, that starts out go-karting cause that's actually where almost, well, every race car driver starts out go-karting. It's the kind of the earliest you can get behind a motor vehicle. Right. Um, so when I was into karting with my dad, you know, every morning we would watch F1. Usually it was in Europe. So you would get up at, you know, the times were like three, four, five in the morning to watch Formula One. And weekends were just dedicated to racing. We'd watch F1. We'd watch uh, IndyCar. Um, 
my dad even got me a little bit into NASCAR. I kind of preferred watching the left and right corners where NASCAR was predominantly just in a circle left. Um, so I'd say my passion growing up was IndyCar and Formula One, and that's what I've targeted. And then as my horizons broadened, you know, you start learning about the Daytona 24 hour and the Le Mans 24 hour for those of the listeners that have seen the Ford versus Ferrari, right. And the, the history of all these different manufacturers competing against each other. So I've kind of just fallen in love with all of it. Um, so if you had to say what a goal was, I would say my goal would be to be a formula car driver, like an Indy car driver that does a full schedule of sports car racing as well. You know, I don't want to be the guy that just specializes in one thing. I kind of just want to branch out and drive everything. And I would even in the end of my career, I'd love to get into rally. Oh. Um, so I'm not picky. If it has four wheels and, a, and an engine, I am all about it. Are you big on the engine side of things too? Or do you need to be as a driver? Well, to I guess to specify, even an electric engine is an engine of sorts. So as long as it's thrusting you forward at a high, high rate of speed, um, I'm probably not going to be too picky. So if a Formula E team is listening to the podcast um, and they said, hey, we don't have a Canadian yet, which they don't. Uh, and they wanted to give some Canadian kid a shot, I would definitely take it uh, to the fullest extent. Nice. What's your favorite team growing up? Was it Ferrari? Was it McLaren? McLaren. Um, that was, yeah, in F1, it was McLaren. And then in IndyCar, it was more driver specific. But um, for IndyCar, for a team, Team Penske is kind of just the, you know, they've even got the, they've coined Penske perfect because they are the epitome of uh, perfection in IndyCar. So, that would be my, my dream team to drive for in any car. And then McLaren is just the history there. And, you know, even going back to Bruce McLaren and how that team became, you know, from a driver to a team, it's pretty, uh, pretty unique. It's a remarkable story. And obviously it was tragic what happened to him on a practice run. I think it was practice lap. It was practice. Yeah. And it wasn't in formula one. It was actually in a, uh, a Can-Am car, Can-Am. which the, yeah, they, they raced, Bruce McLaren at the time had raced a number of different stuff as they did back in the day. And they still try and do it. That actually kind of goes back to why I want to race so many things. Most drivers are specified now, right? Like the formula one guys don't race the Indy 500 where back in the day, they all came over during the month of May for the Indy 500. So you got to race a lot of different stuff, not just one thing, which is cool. What is one of your favorite movies? Do you like Cena or any of those movies that you've seen? (sighs) I mean, this is going to sound terribly cheesy, but, (laughs) and it's not even that I love NASCAR for it, but I think if you just said my favorite racing movie, I'm a comedy guy. So Talladega Nights. Shake and Bake. (laughs) Shake and Bake. I think that was just, uh, yeah. That was a good movie though. (laughs) It was a good movie. Um, And then if we talk racing movies, I think the two most recent ones, Rush and then um, Ford vs. Ferrari kind of showcase what it was like to be a race car driver back then. And I think they're the most, they're probably the most real movies. Obviously Senna was a documentary, but even since that documentary's come out, there's so much that we oh my God. didn't know about Senna that now we're starting to learn about him. Um, not to say I'm not a big Senna fan, but for whatever reason, he was before my time and I didn't really connect with him a whole lot. Um, what about James Hunt or Nicky Lauda? Yeah. So, I mean, if I was going to choose the two out of the rush, I would say that, no. I like the Lauda approach. I mean, yeah. obviously, everybody would love to be James Hunt, which is yeah. the likable party guy that just goes fast. But this day and age in race car drivers, if you're not Lauda, you're probably not winning. So tell me about that. What does it take to be a winner? Oh, well, I mean, going back to the move to Indianapolis, they have an IndyCar gym here, which is where I train at, which is where okay. most IndyCar – I mean, on, I would say – of race car drivers in the world have stepped foot in that gym. That's no understatement. I would say over half of professional race car drivers around the world, doesn't matter where you are, have stepped foot in, it's called pit fit in Indianapolis. Um, So I train there six days a week when I'm home. And then when I'm not home, they've got an app developed. So I'm still training while I'm on the road with their programs. So not only you have to be incredibly fit, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, you get to the Indy car side of stuff where the G force you're pulling five, six G in a race, but even the sports car side of stuff, um, which is what I'm racing this year in Porsche career cup. It's so hot in the car. Like the heat generated is you, I played hockey all my life. I play 
plenty of sports when I was home. I played badminton. Um, nothing compares to nothing makes you almost pass out like driving a race car in in that type of heat does. Is it because it's the fire retardant? Attire? So you've got three layers of fireproof gear. You've got you know your helmet, your Hans device. You've got all this gear put together. But it's I could go sit in a sauna for that for a couple hours. It's the fact that the engine heat soaks the entire cockpit of the car. And then, I mean, it's, you're hitting the brake. Uh, so let's take into consideration my most recent race at Circuit of the Americas, which is an F1 track. Um, 20 turns, 10 big braking corners. So 10 times I have to hit the brake over a thousand pounds on my left foot to get the car to stop, which is a 2,500 pound sports car to get it to stop from going 170 miles an hour. So you're hitting the brake, you know, 10 times a lap. I have to do about 40 laps in the race. So you can do the math quickly. That's a lot of times you're hitting that brake a thousand pounds each time. And then the steering, you know, you're sawing at the wheel the entire time. A lot of people think it's, you know, like driving on a street where you can mm-hmm. one hand it or, but it's, you are death gripping the wheel to just hold on to the car. So um, the other p- thing people don't realize you, yes, it has power steering. Now IndyCar actually doesn't have power steering. You got to get into your categories. Formula One does, IndyCar doesn't. Some series do, some series don't. The sports car I drive does have power steering, but it's turned down so much because you wouldn't be able to actually feel what the car is doing with your hands and your feet if it was turned up all the way. So it's, it's kind of just there to guide you. It's not even, you don't really even notice it at all. It's is still it, really heavy. To is turn it the electronic? Wheel. Yep. Yeah. So the wheel, yeah, it's all sequential paddle shifts. Do you prefer the manual old school? Um, Yes and no. I think for this day and age of driving, I I think about it all the time. What era of car would I have liked to have drove? And I think the 70s, 80s would be my all time if I was in F1 in any car. That was like the all time. They hit the highest horsepower back then. You know, they were replacing engines after every session because they that's how fast they were pushing everything. This day and age, you know, they're with environmental concerns you know, racing is really becoming an avenue to be green, right? So that's a long way of saying that it's very hybrid-esque, this form of racing. So I'm not going to say one is better than the other. They both took a lot of skill to compete at at a high level. I think the paddle shift wheel looks pretty cool. I mean, the Porsche wheel looks like you're driving a spaceship. It's pretty Um, cool. I saw some videos. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to complain. The steering wheels in the 70s and 80s look like they went through (laughs) <laughs> a battlefield they're all ripped and yeah. torn up and they're kind of ugly looking but nothing feels like um nothing feels as good as putting a lap together with an h pattern with actually having to heel toe and clutch mm-hmm. and that was something i learned early in my career and, and honestly race car drivers i would be about the last born in 98 i would be about the last year of race car driver that even had to do that that even had to know what an h pattern was because it's everything has went to sequential paddles. So we use a clutch, but only to get out of first gear or out of neutral into first gear. Um, so yeah, kind of sad. It's kind of like handwriting, right? I was, uh, I just was in a conversation the other day, handwriting in school. Uh, my grade in Alberta was the last grade to do handwriting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I was a split. The 98 year uh, was the last grade to learn how to cursive write, which you wouldn't think was a thing, but you know, you, my grandparents cursive, right. That's all I get is cursive writing from them. So it's, it's funny to think how, you know, it's not just in race cars, but. Yeah. And things that they move time. ahead. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How did you, I mean, Porsche, Porsche has got this new program introduced to Canada or North America. Sorry. How did you get involved with that? Cause you're one of the first to be a part of this. Yeah. So it's, it's been 30 years in the making. It's funny that you probably can't see it very good, but they gave us, they gave every driver in the series a poster. It's my first poster in my apartment. (laughs) So I went and got it framed, but it's, uh, it says 30 years in the making on it. They've been trying to bring the German and the, the European Carrera cup to North America. So it's, it's a, essentially a Porsche feeder series to find the next Porsche factory drivers. So Porsche has about, 30 to 40 factory drivers that they pay um, to drive all over the world, to drive their product to the highest level in all the different championships all over the world. But they need to find drivers just like formula one teams do just like any, anyone does. So they've, 
they came up with a very unique way. Not only does it support them financially um, because it's getting people to race their cars, but it's also finding them talent in the Carrera Cup series. So Carrera Cup is basically their feeder series. We're considered a professional series and there's people getting paid in the series, but at the same time, you're not in what's called the Daytona 24 hour, the Le Mans 24 hour. You know, you're not at that pinnacle of sports car racing yet. You're about, you're about one step away. If you win the Carrera cup, you'll get into those races. So um, it's kind of unique that Porsche has come up with this, this model to find their next talent. And they finally brought it over to North America, which we've been waiting for it for a long time. And how many competitors do you guys have in or each? Is it each category or is it one it's well, so that's where it, I don't want to confuse anybody here. So it's 35 cars in the series and there's about 20 pro category cars. So hopefully you're not getting beat by the remaining 15, not pro category cars. <laughs> and you're number nine for the listeners. Yes. Number nine, Porsche Canada supported car with uh, buyers Porsche. So it's kind of unique. Um, I'm the only Canadian in the series. So it was, uh, it was very cool. I had raced how I, I got the opportunity. Uh, and again, you probably have to ask Porsche Canada how they chose me for the opportunity, but I have a feeling I had raced in Porsche, uh, what was called Porsche challenge GT three cup Canada. Mm-hmm. And this was in 2019. I was racing Indy pro, which is a open wheel car. And I was racing this Canadian series for Porsche and I was doing both. First time ever in a sports car, first year ever in a sports car, and I finished second in the championship. Uh, got some wins, got some pulls, showed enough talent. Um, 2020 happened, and everybody, you know, even before 2020 truly happened, I had already got a ride in, in Formula Cars again, and I was looking to just kind of stay focused in Formula Cars for one year and not do any sports car stuff. But then what had happened in 2020 is uh, – Porsche made the decision to bring over Carrera Cup starting in 2021. So the conversation started last year as to if I would be interested in looking at a ride in, in Porsche Carrera Cup. And as we started getting kind of that closer end of talking to things, it was uh, it turned out to be the best decision that I could have took this year. Last week, what happened? Oh, so joyous last week. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you've, if you've, anybody who's followed me for the last 12 months has known that it has not been an easy 12 months with COVID with all the stuff that happened last year with border travel. Um, So I moved down to the U S last year too. When I say moved, it was more for, it wasn't permanent. I didn't even have an apartment. It was just living race to race because I had to, because I couldn't go back. Um, And then on top of that uh, with COVID and sponsorship, it's really changed a lot of how sponsors are interacting with race teams and, Without fans last year, it was pretty tough um, to come through on all our obligations for sponsors. So Has it been challenging to get sponsors or keep sponsors on. Well, for any athlete, uh, I've heard it's been tough. For sure, I mean, it has to be for anybody. There's nobody in the grandstands, and if there's <laughs> nobody in the grandstands, then eyeballs are are dollar signs, right? But I'm fortunate enough. I think um, going into this year, I've had more financial support and sponsorship than I'd ever had in my career. So. 2021 is great. Everything's off to a great start. 2020, it was tough. Um, you know, it's it's one of those deals where, yes, you have contracts in place, but if you can't come through on your obligations, you can't expect a sponsor to come through on, on theirs. And my sponsors aren't just sponsors. They're, you know, a lot of them I've been with for five, six years. Um, so it, we've developed that friendship. So that was tough, right? The, I think the racing program suffered because we didn't have the, the proper budget in place to really compete last year. And then on top of that, just plain sometimes bad luck. Like I led multiple different races last year and stuff, you couldn't even script stuff happening to me. It was almost like bad luck, Brian, with um, I blew up in the lead a couple of times, engine would just randomly fail and just oh, no. <laughs> certain stuff that made you question like, wow. I need to catch a break. So uh, last week to get a win, it's been my, uh, that was, it just felt great. You know, coming into sports cars again, everybody questioning, oh, you know, he, he's just a formula car guy. Can he really drive sports cars? So to go prove, uh, prove everybody. I like proving the guys right. that believed in me from the start. That felt really good, but also to prove a few people wrong. That felt just as good too. What's the difference formula uh, driver versus uh, 
a sports car driver is in terms of you driving, what is the difference? There's honestly so many. It, yeah. it really is a different discipline. Although I'm a firm believer, just like, um, just like any, I think, pinnacle athlete, even if they had to switch a sport, as long as the fundamentals are the same, I think they could, they could exceed in it. And I think the same goes for race car driving, but it would probably most be compared to almost like, uh, I know this sounds insane, but you've got like ice hockey, roller hockey, right? Where you've, a lot of people probably don't even know how different roller hockey is, but it is quite different, right? You're not, you're one wheels instead of skates. So it's similar movements of how to skate, but at the same quite time, different. It's <laughs> yeah. quite different and racing is the same way, you know, and I, I think the pinnacle driver is the formula car driver. You know, those guys can kind of branch off and do almost anything. They can drive sports cars, they can drive, but it's really tough. Um, to be a sports car driver off the bat and try and I think make the switch back to formula cars. You know, mm. we're seeing that right now in IndyCar with Jimmy Johnson, the seven time NASCAR champion in IndyCar. And I don't want to take anything away from his NASCAR championships. Cause I think the guy's a complete, you know, he's, he's an awesome driver. He's really good. And you can't take that away from him, but it is a huge task to jump into a formula car and go fast. Um, Cause it's just so raw. It's got, no aids at all. And so that brings me to my next point with sports cars is um, just because the car has aids on it doesn't make it any easier for the driver. So what I mean by that is our car has ABS. It has 14 settings of ABS in Porsche Career Cup. The reason why it doesn't make it any easier for us is when you give 20 professional drivers a tool, they figure out how to use it the best against one another. So it, it ends up being just as hard for us to drive the cars to the peak level because now, you know, it's forcing a guy into a mistake is really difficult because with the ABS, he could miss, you know, his brake zone by a meter. And now he's not missing the corner by a meter. He's got ABS to help him get checked up and stop. So it's, it kind of just changes the game on how you drive and strategy. Um, at the end of the day, I think a pinnacle race car driver can drive in any category to a professional level, but um, the biggest difference of sports car and formula car is the weight and then the driver rates. So the weight is, you know, almost double the amount in a sports car over a formula car. And then you've got all these fancy ABSs. And then once you get into, you know, the pinnacle, which is Le Mans, Daytona, all those classes have traction control. They have fuel maps. They've got a ton of stuff to play with that, um, you know, you can even on some of these, you can change the diff, the differential on the fly. You can change the whole car while you're driving, just like in Formula One or like in, in most pinnacle categories. You guys are riding GT2s or GT3s? GT3s, yeah. GT3s. The, so this car is based off of the Porsche 992 GT3 model. How did you find a way to be so creative in branding yourself? I mean, you've got a beautiful team that's creating some amazing social media content for this day and age, and I think you're killing it. Well, that means a lot, Zach. Um, and I'll tell you why it means a lot is because I do have a beautiful team composed of me and <laughs> and um, I'm going to give a shout out to him. His name is Quentin Osborne in Calgary. Um, Quentin has done, we've done a lot together. Um, all, everything together. So I've built my own websites. I've built all my own social media. I've, I pretty much started doing it all myself. And then it got to the point where I was just so overloaded with stuff. I needed help. Right. And Quentin is my part-time and hopefully I've, I've told him this from day one, when I'm, when I'm making as a race car driver, he is going to run my marketing because he's a brilliant guy. Um, we're, I'm really proud of the stuff that we've been able to come up with. Quentin, he'll attest to this. I'm an ideas guy. Like I love to come up with different ways to do stuff, but then I have to find the time to do it. And Quentin is the time and the guy that puts, you know, what I feel is the idea to paper and he does it usually even better than I thought originally what it would look like. So a good example of that is the PTR live. So for the longest time, yes, you've been doing we've that. been struggling with a way to get people to watch my races because I'm predominantly racing away from home. The time zones are different. And then every race weekend, it seems like they're sending people to different websites, whether it be YouTube one weekend or Porsche Motorsport North America, the next or Porsche US dot whatever the next. So we kind of just said to heck with that we're going to find a way to get PTR live, which is built on the back end of our website. So you can watch all my races um, right on my website, which is awesome. So he's a huge part of that. 
And then on the video side of stuff, it's, it's honestly just using local professionals everywhere we go. We kind of connect with local they're they're honestly artists you know it's videography edits your content after it no it's uh, so i edit some of it and then it's usually just the local videographer that does most of the grunt work to get it i love that that you're doing that oh it's so awesome i I wish more athletes did that in their own respective field because you've really humanized your brand and i think that's huge and as a sponsor yeah, yeah, you might not be getting the eyeballs that way, but you're definitely getting them via social media. And I think you really hit the hammer to the nail with that one. I appreciate it. And that's, um, you know, it's it's honestly what I've learned in, in traveling with it too is just how many talented people there are everywhere. You know, like it's it does not take a lot to find good videographers where you go. It does not take a lot to find good photographers. Um, and most of them are, a lot of them are up or coming. You know, they'll... It's not like they're charging, you know, some videographers it's, and don't get me wrong. I have full respect for it. Just like me as a race car driver, it's your craft. And when you're there 100%, but I've been able to help them get jobs in motorsport, which is kind of cool. Like um, I've had two different guys work with me this year already. And they both, after I've worked with them, got jobs in motorsports. Almost immediately. I love it. Are you using Final Cut or Adobe Premiere? I use Premiere for any of the stuff I do. They... (laughs) They use an array of stuff. Um, you, you'll notice a guy too. I can shout him out. Mark Urban. He's a Canadian out of Toronto that does a lot of IMSA shooting. So I worked with him in Sebring. He's unreal. Yeah. Um, it's a real art form. You know, I don't, I'm not going to take anything away from, you know, a videographer that hasn't shot racing before, but they need to have shot a moving item before to know how to capture it. And uh, no, it's pretty cool. So I'm not going to take any of the credit. All my own social media is me. Every time I post something or comment to people, I'm the only one that runs uh, runs that social media. Yes. But um, the creator of the content, I mean, Quentin does an awesome job with what we do on the web and, and what we do even with our just our graphics and stuff. And then uh, I utilize local videographers and local talent. Parker, before we get going here, what does it take for you to get prepared for a race mentally, what do you have to do? Cause you have to be on, you have to be sharp, don't you? <laughs> yeah. hundred um, percent. So I have a few brain exercises, which sounds kind of funny, but um, just trying to get the left and the right side of the brain activated and working with each other is important. And then uh, the other side of it too, is that, that confidence, right? And it's almost that swagger um, to get into the, the zone and getting into the zone for me happens a long time before I show up to the track. And it's something I think I've struggled with in my career because I've, when you're working to fund your career, plus you're working to drive the race car, uh, thing timelines can get overlapped and you end up working on, you know, a day where you probably should have just used it as a travel day and got to the race. But now you're worried about taking phone calls and emails and replying. And, um, so the best thing I think I've ever done for myself mentally is just take that step back and block that day or two off before the race, um, go play golf or, so I'm a big golfer. I'm not great by any means, but it just gets me, it gets me away and it lets me focus on something, you know, that's next to racing. I feel like golf is the most mental sport in the world, right? Because the difference of a good shot and a bad shot is, you know, one millimeter on a club is 10 yards. So oh my God. when you're, when you're back in Calgary or we'll, we'll go play golf. We'll go for perfect. Yeah, awesome. I can't wait. That'd be great. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And, wh- and what about in terms of taking your losses? How does that, how do you deal with it? Cause you know, you're putting everything into it. Yeah. Well, and another unique aspect of racing, right. Is um, you look at a stick and ball sport, an average year is 500. They're winning half their games or losing half their games, right? A great year can be 750. An average race car driver, an average good year, you're lucky to win a race, realistically. Like an Indy car, you're, there's you know probably only five or six guys out of 25 or 30 that are going to win a race this year. And that could be wrong. I mean, you maybe get those odd years where it's 10. I mean, look at Formula One, though. It's you know, it's Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen winning races with the occasional Botas shocker, yeah, exactly. um, you know? So you, I think as race car drivers, you're already kind of prone to it throughout your career. You know that you're not winning a whole lot and that um, you have to focus on the big picture, which is a championship and winning races doesn't necessarily win the championship. It's those, uh, I think the days that win the championship are when you had a fifth place car and you got second or third. 
but when you had a 10th place car and you got fifth or when you, you know, you could have finished fourth, but you decided better against it to not crash out and make yourself worse in that situation. So um, I think I have good hindsight and I have a good head on my shoulders. That's probably what's allowed me to not crash cars because team owners don't like that. It doesn't matter what championship you're competing for. You can't crash. And then on top of that, it's always helped me in the championship standings as well. When's your next race? Next race is June 23rd okay. at the famous uh, Watkins Glen International Raceway. So okay. so does a car travel with you right now? or? So, no. JDX Racing is the team I race for. Um, a little backstory on them. Jeremy Dale is the owner. He's the JD in JDX, and he's actually from Toronto, which is cool. Mm, okay. um, so that's also what's unique. Unfortunately, I don't have my helmet here, but the reason I have the Rocky Mountains on both sides of my helmet this year is because – they're from Colorado. The whole team is, and I'm from Alberta and the Rocky mountains connect us. So it's kind of a cool, cool little bond that we have. Um, the car after every race goes back to Colorado and they work on it and get it prepped for the next race. And then it, uh, it travels separately. They have two semis that take, uh, the entire team. They have about four or five cars that come to just about every race. My gosh. And I love that you bring your little stuffies with you in the car. <laughs> So that's, yeah, the, the joke on that for the listeners that probably have no idea what these bears are and the moose and the beaver in a canoe. Um, the team, our team Trucky, who the guy who drives the truck for us, he stops at truck stops and I, he just thinks I'm a funny Canadian. So he gets me Canadian items everywhere he goes across the country. And then he always puts them in my car when they load my car out, which is, so it's always a surprise. There's always something new in there. No, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Parker. Oh, Zach, thank you for having me on. And uh, anytime, you were a pleasure to talk to. We'll make some videos when you're back too. Uh, yeah, for sure. I'd love fun. to. All right, man. Yeah. Thank you again. Eh? Have a good day. Thanks. Good yeah, on. you too. See you.